Good morning. Well, that says there's still a minute left, but it's close. I could just pause here for a minute and wait till it says 12 or 11. Or we can just go on. Uh, and welcome this morning. Tonight we have snack night. We'll have favorites in the evening service, favorite songs. I was debating if we should do something different for, for the evening service, but we're up to Psalm 33, and the bulletin had a verse from Psalm 33 on the cover, so I thought that was pretty much like, well, we have to cover Psalm 33 now. So we'll do Psalm 33 tonight, but we'll have favorites. Don't forget your praise, prayer, testimony, thanksgiving, and memory verses. I heard some kids brushing up on some memory verses this morning or struggling with some memory verses this morning. It was one or the other. You weren't struggling? You were confusing other people? Okay. So be sure to bring those to share. Uh, we should have plenty of Thanksgiving. We've got plenty of Thanksgiving on our boards or uh, poster boards up here. You can feel free to add anything more to those you want to. Lots of things to be thankful for. And uh, Paul was thankful in prison that the gospel was going out, even though he wasn't the one doing it. Did you learn some thankfulness downstairs, upstairs? Did Mrs. Fredrickson's class learn thankfulness upstairs? Oh, good. We were working on it down here, and we decided that we just have to practice doing it no matter what we feel like. So when you don't feel like being thankful, is the best time to be thankful because then you're practicing it. And uh, hope that the details fill themselves in later as far as what, why you're thankful for the things you're thankful for. As far as updates on praise and prayer items, uh, we'll continue to remember Bob Little. Uh, had a heart attack and was hospitalized. We haven't heard anything regarding that, but they had him initially put into a coma to help with the uh, figure out what to do with the heart issues. Sam and Olivia Olson are heading back to Cedarville this afternoon. Oh, tomorrow. That's right. They have Monday off for traveling. I forgot. And Sam even told me that they have Monday off from school because we saw Sam at Target and we saw Robin at Walmart. They were traveling around doing the uh, shopping tour on Friday as well. So, uh, For my dad, his sixth chemo treatment is tomorrow. And for Jen's dad, the prostate surgery is moved off till December 7th. And uh, still a lot of details there and other surgeries and, and needs with that. So lots of things to keep in prayer and uh, to keep before the Lord. Austin, can you lead us off in a word of prayer as we start off this morning? Take our hymnals 234, crown him with many crowns. When you find all this, stand together. 234. Can fully bear that song. 
sing Who died and rose on high Who died eternal life to bring And lives at death may die Crowned in the Lord of heaven One with the Father Days are joined and magnified. Thank you. you. May be seated. Go to 505. 505. Love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin. From the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. souls a song faithful love and service to do him belong love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else would help love lifted Number 88, Fairest Lord Jesus. Number 88. Oh. 
If you stand for the scripture reading today out of Matthew, and we'll the reference to begin the ending. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Thank you, Ms. Stephen. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we take up our offering this morning. Again, Father, we're grateful for you. We're grateful for your goodness to us. We're grateful that the hope we have in you. Your word tells us that all things work together for good, that you work all things together for good and Father, that takes faith, that took, takes hope and trust on our part, and, and we're grateful to know that, that you are working on our behalf. We pray, Father, as we give back to you a portion of what you've blessed us with this week, that you would continue to meet our needs, that you would be pleased with our, our gifts as we give them, and we'll thank and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Name that offertory. It will be worth it all. When we see Christ. When we see Christ. 
I wrote down what Beth said. It will be worth it all. Like, that's the first part of the chorus. That's normally the title, right? So anyone wanting to write a modern hymn, what you have to do is make sure the title doesn't match up with the first words of the verse or the first words of the chorus, and then you'll confuse people. But our hymn book has you covered, because you can look it up by the first words of the hymn, although not necessarily by the first words of the chorus. They should add that. It would be another index. We only have like seven of them in the back of the hymn book. So we are in Exodus chapter 20 this morning. And when we hear Exodus chapter 20, we think, all right, someone's been paying attention. Well, a couple of you, because I heard, I heard that it was in stereo where available. The Ten Commandments. And anytime I come to preaching the Ten Commandments, I have this, this moment of, of trouble trying to figure out, do I do one commandment at a time? Do I do all Ten Commandments all at once? Do I break them up somehow? And uh, I didn't look back to see how I did them last time. This time, we're breaking them up. And we're breaking them up the way Jesus broke them up. What's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So this morning, we're dealing with the first four commandments. I never realized, um, apparently I didn't study enough in seminary and Bible college, to realize that there's different views on how the Ten Commandments are numbered. But there's ten. It's a decalogue, the ten words of God. And uh, but there are some that that break up what we would consider the tenth commandment into two commandments. And different people break up the tenth commandment in different ways. And uh, there's there's a whole chart on Wikipedia if you want to see the division of the Ten Commandments. And how the various views are, whether Protestant, Catholic, Reformed, and uh, I think Seventh-day Adventist even have their own breakup. The what? Orthodox. Orthodox. That's another one of them. There's, there's like nine categories of how to divide up the Ten Commandments. One of them, um, one of the listings has verse 2 as the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God. Um like, well, that's weird. That's only weird because of how we're used to it, I suppose. And since we don't have the two tablets of stone to have them numbered for us, I guess we can assume that we're right, but uh, I guess don't go staking anything significant on that. Uh, although that would tend to be the, I think that's the way that we break them up is the way the Septuagint broke them up. The Greek translation of the Old Testament broke it up the way that we are commonly familiar with it. So as we are commonly familiar with it, we are covering the first four commandments this morning. Other ways of viewing it, we could be viewing five commandments. I think that's the only other way to view the first four that we have is five. And our title this morning, Keep God First. As looking at the first four commandments, how do we sum them up? For a title, I guess summed it up differently than Jesus did, not because I think I'm better than Jesus, I'm certainly not, but because I think there's a help to viewing things with a different wording sometimes. And so the title could have been, Love God with All Your Heart, Soul, Mind, and Strength, but that wouldn't have fit in the bulletin nicely on one line. Um, it could just be Love God. But sometimes when we think of Love God, we get that warm, fuzzy feeling, and we have warm feelings towards God, therefore we're doing it. So I wanted to re <laughs> excuse me, rephrase it a little bit. Keep God first. Now, many places in the New Testament, we read that we are not under the law. And so when we come to the Ten Commandments, we have interesting thoughts and views and what do we do about it? Uh, we read in the New Testament that Christ in his death on the cross has freed us from bondage to the law. That we are not responsible to keep the law. Our, our salvation, our holiness is not dependent on keeping the, the law. But we can't write off the truth of God's law. Nor can we ignore what God's law calls us to. In fact, as we look at the Ten Commandments, all of them but one are repeated in the New Testament. You know which one isn't repeated in the New Testament? 
Well, that's a good one for next Bible quiz night, right? Remember the Sabbath. Not repeated in the New Testament. So, oh, good. We can, we can cross off number four, and we don't have to do that one then, right? Except that the principle of remembering the Sabbath is based in God's creative order that he created in six days and took the seventh day off. Uh, it's, it's not new revelation when it comes in Exodus chapter 20. So anyway, we have the commandments mostly repeated in the New Testament. The one that we don't have repeated is based in the fact that God created in six days and rested the seventh. He hallowed, made holy, set apart the seventh day, which Seventh-day Adventists today will say, well, that's why you need to keep the Sabbath. Well, the principle is work six days, take the seventh day of rest and hallow it. And in the early church, they worshiped on Sunday and that got kind of carried forward. Martin Luther had some interesting things to say about that when it comes to remembering the Sabbath. He said, we need to remember the Sabbath, but we shouldn't like set the whole world on end. We've been worshiping on Sunday for, at that point, close to 1500 years. So why would he upend things and change the day? Uh, the Sabbath is not what's the important part. The important part is a rest from our labors one day out of seven. But anyway, as we look at this, I want to break these four verses apart, four, not four verses, these four commandments apart. Some of them are one verse, uh, but most of them are more than one verse. And look at them uh, from the perspective of keeping God first. Because as God gave the Ten Commandments, the idea was to have his people remember him and prioritize him. Next week, we'll look at the fact that God wants us, God cares about how we treat our neighbor. God wants us to love our neighbors. That's what the other six commandments deal with and, and, and how we ought to do that. But this morning, keep God first. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's interesting, uh, as I was looking at that, to realize that one word is repeated three times in those three verses. And Elohim, a name for God, a plural name for God. It's interesting. You'll remember I've mentioned the, the I am, the im ending in Hebrew is like an S in English. So, so that would be like Elo's. And Elo's said, it's plural. But in the Old Testament, Elohim can be used with a singular verb or a plural verb. You say, well, what's the difference? In English, not very much most of the time. In Spanish, though, we have the singular you and the plural you. We have the singular he and the plural they and different verb forms. Elohim is a plural word, but in reference to God, we can look at it that it is plural because he is a trinity. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or we can look at the plurality as being the like the royal we. It's plural because of his majesty. And so when it says, and God spake, and Elohim spake, Elohim is plural, but spake is singular, the verb, because it's just God. And Elohim spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy Elohim, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other Elohim before me. Oh, well, that's weird. We get to use the same word in two different contexts in three different verses. And actually, I do apologize. In verse 2, it's not Elohim. It's another ver uh, version of Elohim that means thy God. Because the thy gets to be part of the word. And I think it's Elo Eloheka or something along those lines. Don't quote me on that. But it had a different ending because it's thy God. But Elohim spake these things saying, You shall have no other Elohim before me. Keep God first. Keep God unique. Keep God alone in our worship. No other gods before him. So the gods in verse 3 could be plural or it could be singular. No other God before me. Because it's the same word as we have in verse 1, and God spake. 
how do we keep God first, unique in our worship, and have no other gods before him? One way is we need to recognize God's hand at work. When we give credit to something else for what God has done, we have put another God before God. When we miscredit what's done, we need to recognize his hand. Well, where do we see his hand at work? Well, obviously, we're, we've been practicing being thankful for things. And we recognize and we've repeated repeatedly that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Recognize his hand. Do we recognize his hand for every good and perfect gift? Or do we stop to recognize our hand for the good things we have? Well, you know, some of them. I, I must be responsible for some of the good things I have, right? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. The way we recognize his hand is by giving him the glory. Now, giving him the glory, you know, well, yeah, he can have all the glory. I'll give him the glory. But glory, another word, to, way to put glory is credit. Give him the credit. And see, we're, we're selfish. We're prideful. We're boastful. We like to keep credit for things we do. We like to be able to say, well, that is a result of what I have worked hard to do. That is a result of what I have learned, what I have developed, what I have practiced, what I have done. That is a result of my talents. That is a result of my strength. That is a result of my abilities. That is a result of fill in the blank with whatever you want there. But if we're going to keep God first in our worship and not have any other gods before him, we have to remember that one of the primary gods we put in the place of God is ourself. And we like to give ourselves a credit, the glory, for a lot of the good things that we have. Now, occasionally, we'll take the credit for some of the bad things in our life as well. Oop, that was me. Oops, I didn't do that. Recognize his hand. Give him the glory. As I was watching a, a car repair video this week, it was a 19, oh no, 2003 Ford F-150, the Harley Davidson edition. It had the badge on the side, which was a 5.4 liter uh, supercharged engine. He was trying to figure out why it had a lean code. So he went through the, the various things and the whole time I'm looking at that air cleaner, the air filter that's hanging out in an open box not closed in or anything and it's just filthy he finally removed that filter and the the engine trims the the fuel trims came back into line and it stopped running lean when they took the air filter off and he goes wow is this just a case of bad maintenance and among other things it got me thinking oh i wonder why my car stumbles sometimes like when i turn the wheel all the way to one side it like wants to die like I wonder if there's a maintenance issue there. I'm sure I replaced the spark plugs when I bought that car. It's got 225,000 miles on it. I, I would have. So I popped the hood because if I'm going to replace the plugs, I wanted to make sure the wires didn't need replacing. My car doesn't have spark plug wires. The coils are right on top of the spark plugs, which is when I realized if I didn't remember that it didn't have spark plug wires, I didn't ever remove those plugs. I didn't do it. I take credit for that. I messed up in my maintenance. But then sometimes I like to look and say, boy, this car is running well. The air conditioner works now. This works. Well. It's so smooth. It's because of what I... Uh, we like to take the credit for things. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from God. Give him the glory. Praise him. Thank him. And... And, you know, we need to make sure we're not doing it like the, the publican. God, I thank you that I am not like this vile, wretched sinner. Recognize his hand. Give him the glory. Don't give glory or credit where it doesn't belong. The places we can give glory or credit to. We can give glory or credit to ourselves. We can give glory or credit 
to wealth, whether it's our wealth or someone else's. We can give glory or credit to to uh, uh, employers, to to paychecks. We can give credit to science. Oh, it's just amazing what science can do. Um, when we realize science is a study of what God has given us and how it all works together, even science is, is a gift of God. We can give glory to technology. <laughs> Normally it goes the other way, right? We say, isn't technology great when technology isn't working right? I picked up the hand scanner at Walmart the other day and it's, it started beeping at me. I didn't notice it right away. Jen pointed it out. I'm like, oh, maybe it needs to sit back in its charger. And the light turned green, so I picked it up again, and it did the same thing. Fine, I'll go to the other one. I have to use a hand scanner because picking up my items and swinging it across the desk there, that's hard work. Jen was nice enough to point out before we left that another lady, a lady came up to use that register before we left, and the scanner wasn't beeping at her. Isn't technology great? We give it a lot of credit sometimes, but credit that we don't need to give it. Or other deities, other things that we worship. No other gods before God. Worship no one else but the God responsible for creation. The God responsible for our provision. The God responsible for our life. The God responsible for the blessings in our life. Give no one else the credit. But what God deserves goes to him. Keep God first, unique in our worship. Secondly, verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Keep God first. Don't change God. Don't redefine God. No graven image. First graven image was when Aaron stood before the people of Israel and said, Behold, your God that brought you up out of the land of Egypt, the golden calf. As Moses was getting this, it was taking place. But the graven image, don't make any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or the earth beneath. Don't worship the creation. Don't worship idols. Don't fashion your own God. Don't try to define God your way. You ever hear people trying to define God their own way? Well, God is love. And therefore, I'm going to define God based on what I think love is. Well, that's amazing. Um, when we try to define God based on what we think love is or how we think love should be shown, we're trying to redefine love and therefore redefine God. Well, the God of the Bible, the God I worship would never do that because he's a God of love. Well, love is not a one-faceted characteristic. It's a multifaceted characteristic. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. It is the loving thing to do to train. It is the loving thing to do to correct. <laughs> it's the loving thing to do to let us fall on our faces sometimes when we're trying to do it on our own. Don't fashion your own God. Don't try to define God your way. Why would we ever want to fashion God our own way? Sometimes we do it because we want to make God easier to understand. The illustrations, you know, well, the Trinity is like an egg. There's a shell, there's a white, and there's a yolk. Like, well, yeah, but there's also a membrane that holds the white in. And inside of the yolk, um, if it's a fertilized egg, there's a, there's a little, is it called a zygote in chicken eggs? There's a little seedling of a chicken there that's going to grow and to develop and feed off of that yolk while it's growing in the egg to make it into a chicken. There's a lot of parts to an egg. Well, it's, it's like an egg. There's a shell, a white, and a yolk, and it's all the egg, but it's... Well, why do we do that? Because it's hard to understand how God can be one, and yet there's a Father, there's a Spirit, 
and there's the Son, Jesus Christ, and they're distinct people, but they're the same God, and there's only one God. Well, we try to make God easier to understand. I, I'm not saying that to say there's a problem with the egg illustration, or however you want to illustrate the Trinity to make it make sense. But sometimes we try to define God to make him easier for us to understand, easier for us to wrap our mind around. When we say, I don't understand how, how a loving God could do this, we're saying, I think God can only do what makes sense to me. And we dealt with that in Sunday school a little bit in our class of, imagine if you got rid of everything in the world you didn't understand. Imagine if you tried to define everything in terms you could understand. Your car would probably look more like a bicycle. Because we can understand how angular force on a pedal creates rotational force, which drives linear force on a chain to drive rotational force on that back sprocket to drive the wheel down. The we can understand that, unless you got one of those fancy three speeds that have all that hidden transmission-y stuff inside of the hub. That's magic. I don't, do you know how that works? Do you know how that works? Daniel does three speeds, the little chain and stuff inside the sprocket. I've never peeled back the, the onion to see. Ben understands it. He'll explain it later for all of us. It's magic. It's what I don't understand. But if we limit it to what we could understand, our world would look a whole lot different than it does. And we try to redefine God to make him more understandable. Or maybe to make God more palatable. When it says God's wrath was poured out. Oh, well, I don't know that. Because wrath isn't a good thing. Now, unholy wrath isn't a good thing. Selfish wrath isn't a good thing. Prideful wrath isn't a good thing. But none of those things impact God's wrath. God's wrath is holy, just, and good. And so when we try to say, well, God can't have wrath because wrath is bad, we're trying to make God like us. God's wrath is holy wrath. It's good. Well, how can wrath be good? Well, God is good. Everything he is is good. Sometimes we redefine God because we want to replace God. Because if we can replace God, then we can ignore some of the things that he has said. Well, I, I don't really like that, so I'm going to make my own God up. And you can find those all over the Internet. Lots of people have made up who they, well, I wasn't really happy with the Christian God. I wasn't really happy with the God of the Bible. So I've made up this God and this is what I believe in. Like, really? That's like sitting down to a table like they did in, in, in a, an old movie called Hook. They sat down at an empty table and they started pretending they were feasting on food. They just all dreamt up in their mind. Well, that's a wonderful thing to do and you can enjoy that to a degree. But when you're done, your stomach's still empty and you don't have any nourishment. And when you create your own God, yes, you can, you can design him however you want to, but when you're left, you're left with nothing because that God doesn't exist. Keep God first. Don't change or redefine him. Why? Because God is jealous. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation to them that hate me. I saw this week a list of 21 reasons why you should raise your children without religion. And most of the reasons don't actually apply. It's because they need to develop morality apart from fear. Let's apply that in all areas of our life. Police officers should not carry guns. We should learn morality, following the law and doing what's good without the fear. And I think the gun on, on the hip is fearful. Because I also read this, this week that guns only have one purpose, and that's to kill people. So for all of you deer hunters, you're using it wrong, obviously. Um, to learn morality apart from fear. Now, I think we should learn to be moral people without being afraid that God's going to get us. I, I don't think that should be our primary motivation of doing the right and the good choice. Our primary motivation should be to honor God and to love God and to show our love for him. But here he says, because God is jealous. 
We need to honor God. And don't change or redefine him. No graven image. But not just because God is jealous, but verse 6, because God is merciful. We serve a merciful God. Keep God first. No graven image. Keep God first, verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Keep God first. Respect his name. Don't use it vainly. How do we take the name of the Lord our God in vain? Now, when I was a kid, I learned you're supposed to say, oh my goodness. Because saying, oh my God, is bad. And I really had problems singing a praise chorus from the 80s where it was straight from the Psalms and it said, oh my God, I trust in thee. And I thought, I'm not supposed to say that. Because that's taking the name of the Lord in vain. Well, no, that's that's worshiping God. And in the psalm, oh my God, I trust in thee, is not taking his name vainly. But we take his name vainly when we use his name worthlessly, vainly, in an empty fashion, or lightly. Do believers use God's name lightly? Whew in a couple different ways. Sometimes believers can use God's name lightly in exclamation. If you've ever heard someone use the name of Jesus and they're not calling out to him, they're exclaiming that something wrong has happened. Something bad has happened. They don't like the situation. And so they just cry out Jesus as if it's a bad name. Well, yes, that's using the name of the Lord our God in vain. Oh my God, oh, I'm so surprised, oh my God. Well, we're not actually referencing the God of the universe, the God of creation, that's using his name vainly. Lord God Almighty. Oh, well, well that one's gotta be better, right? Because it's got Almighty in there. But when we use that just as an exclamation to fill in the blank for something else, we're using his name vainly. We can use his name worthlessly in swearing. You ever heard someone say, I swear to God, I swear to God. Or are they actually, I've heard people say swear to God when they're flat out lying and I knew they were lying. I've had that happen with students in school sometimes. Like, did you copy this off of your neighbor? I still remember that uh, typing class where the kid handed in a typing paper with the same three errors in exactly the same place as a girl that was sitting next to him the whole period. Uh, you copied. No, I didn't. Swear to God. If it flows so quickly off our mouth and, and the name of God doesn't add any reverence to what we're saying, then we're using it vainly. When they take the Bible into a courtroom and they make someone put their hand on the Bible and swear to uphold their their the duties of their office. They could be taking God's name vainly. But we also learn in the Beatitudes that it goes far beyond just taking the name of God vainly. Um, Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> the uh, prohibition gets a, a bit bigger for taking things vainly. Uh, in verse 33, again, you have heard it that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Hear people say, I remember back when oh, Survivor first came out and they made alliances and people would say, I swear on my mother's grave. What would Jesus say about that? Don't swear on your mother's grave. You can't bring her back. <laughs> Nothing you can do about that. Don't swear on your head because you can't make one hair white or gray. One or white or black. <laughs> I guess white or gray, kind of the same thing. 
Don't use his name vainly in swearing. Don't use his name vainly in our speech. As believers, sometimes we like to say, well, God told me. We ought to be careful with that. God told me. Hey, if you've read it straight from his word, God showed me that I have a problem with this sin in my life that I need to make right. Yes, God told you. But when a believer says, God told me, and then inputs what they want to do next, that's using the name of God in vain. Well, God told me. Well, aren't we supposed to look for God's leading? So God needs to be able to lead us. Yes, absolutely. I believe God is leading this way. Great. God told me. Hmm. Make sure we don't use that lightly. It was when we use that lightly, we're in danger of not respecting his name. Deuteronomy chapter 18 speaks about that speaking in the name of God. Uh, he said, well, Deuteronomy 18, that's talking about for prophets. But I think it applies to how we use God in our speech as well. Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning in verse 19. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet that has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. In our speech, make sure we reverence the name of God, that we don't throw that around lightly. And James, it tells us, don't say, today or tomorrow I will go and do this thing and that thing or that thing. But you should say, if the Lord wills. And so, in, in modern Christian, we say, Lord willing, and the cricks don't rise. You know, that great expression. Because that way, we're not just presuming to speak what we're going to do without letting God have a part in it. Lord willing. Uh, but how often is that spoken just because that's what you say on, 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 on something and you're not actually thinking, if the Lord wills. You're not actually giving space for that. You're like, this is what we're doing, and if it doesn't come to pass, I'm going to be very put out. In our speech, keep God first. Respect his name. Use his name reverently. Now, the Jews took that for the, the fact that they shouldn't speak his name out loud. Well, obviously, if we don't speak it, then we don't have a problem, right? We won't speak the name Yahweh or Jehovah or however it was pronounced. We won't speak it out loud and therefore we can't break that. But anytime a Jewish person would say, Jesus talked about it, um, what I have to take care of my parents in their old age is Corbin. It's dedicated to the Lord. Therefore, I can't fulfill my responsibilities. You know, they're taking the name of the Lord, their God, in vain. They've said they've devoted something unto God, therefore they can't use it to do something that God has commanded them to do. <laughs> oh. Keep God first, respect his name. Keep God first, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And with the Sabbath, keep God first, take a break for God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's interesting. It doesn't say remember the Sabbath day to keep it restful. To keep it holy. You see, the Jews interpreted it as remember the Sabbath day to keep it restful. Why did they interpret it that way? Because verse uh, uh, 9, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, ah, therefore it's rest. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and the sea and all that is in them is, and rested the seventh day. 
Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. There's two parts to that. God rested on the seventh day and God hallowed the seventh day. Keep God first. Take a break. First of all, we learned that the Sabbath was given by God for rest. It is a gift of God for us to rest from our labors. Now, in the world that we live in today, there are people that say, well, we should have a four-day work week. I've heard people say that four days of work a week is too many days of work. But I appreciated when I, I stopped off at, at uh, Harbor Freight the other day, I asked my, my former boss, one of my former bosses, I said, well, how was your first week back at work? And she said, great. I really needed to come back. I was getting very lackadaisical at home. Working is good, and, and, and being occupied is good, and having labor to do is good, but rest is good. Without rest, we just go on, and, and actually studies have proven that when you don't take rest, it is bad for your productivity. It is bad for your mental uh, well-being. Take a rest, a break for God. It is a rest from God that he has given us, but it is also a rest for God because he hallowed the day and he asked the Jews to keep it holy. Now we know Sabbath keeping is not repeated in the New Testament. In fact, the only time we see uh, that I remember seeing the Sabbath come up was when Jesus was walking through the field with his disciples on the Sabbath and they grabbed some grains of corn or grain and they, they ate it and people accused his disciples of doing what was not lawful on the Sabbath. They were laboring. Well, did God really mean no labor whatsoever? Does God mean that, that we should do what the Jews did? We should have a Sabbath feature on our ovens if we want to use them. You can't light a fire on the Sabbath. You can't kindle a fire on the Sabbath. So your oven has to be running. Well, that's a problem because my oven has an igniter in it. And when it gets too hot, it turns itself off and then it reignites itself. A Sabbath feature would require there to be a little pilot light that stays lit so that the flame doesn't go out. Because if the flame goes out, then even though I'm using an electric igniter that's controlled by a, a microprocessor in the stove, I'm lighting a fire on the Sabbath. I'm laboring. Does God really mean that if you don't get food ready Saturday, you're going to starve on Sunday? Because I've got some tin cans I have to open for casserole night tonight. I should have opened them last night and put them in the fridge because it's always good to store food and open tin cans, right? Because now I can't open them. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And it's not a rest from everything. It's a rest from your labor. It's a rest given for the Lord and a rest given from the Lord. And it's based in creation. God worked six days and rested on the seventh. Did he rest on the seventh because he was tired out? Did, it, did he take six days because all of the work he did in creation took him six full days? And, and boy, I, I wish he would have worked in five days and then taken two days off. No, God created in six days, not because it took him so long to create, because he spoke and it was. And he took six days as an example to us, a labor six days, and he rested on the seventh, not because he was tired, not because his brain requires him to rest. Kind of, when God is a spirit, kind of hard to say his brain, but the portion of God that thinks, did it, was it all worn out? No. So what do we do with the Sabbath? What do we do with a day's rest? We protect it. We guard it. Now, does that mean we never do anything that's labor-related on, on the Sabbath or Sunday as, 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 as believers we, we keep or we reference or we treat that as our day of rest. We never do anything that's labor on the Sabbath. No, Jesus pointed out, if your neighbor's animal falls in a pit, you get it out on the Sabbath. Why? That's not labor. That's compassion. That's mercy. 
That's a good thing to do. If your family is hungry on Sunday, cook food. You're not violating any law, but protect it. Don't let it get crowded out by everything else in life. Don't let it get crowded out by things that don't have any value. It's a rest that's given by God. Oh, well, then I need to go do restful things. You ever notice that when you go to do restful things, it often ends up less restful than, than, than just stopping? Protect it. Use it as God intended. How did God intend it? As a rest from our labors. Why? Keep it holy. It's a holy day. It's a rest from our labors, but it's a time to think upon the things of God. It's a time to focus on his things, not our things. It's a time to realign ourselves with God and, and keep ourselves where we need to be. Because if we just run 24-7 and keep going, we drift from where God wants us to be. Yes, our bodies need the rest, but our minds and our spirits need the hallowing the washing, the cleansing, the keeping separate, the keeping apart. Keep God first. Why? Because God is jealous and he wants us to keep him first? Yes, but also because keeping God first is what's best for us. What God desires for us is what is best for us. We're going to close this morning with hymn number 116. Take the name of Jesus with you. That It's not just about for one day we do these things and, and there we are but that these need to carry into our lives as well. Hymn number 116. 116 in your hymn, will take the name of Jesus with you. When you follow, let's stand together. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will Give you take it then where you go precious name oh how sweet oh of earth and joy of air precious name oh how sweet oh of earth and joy of air take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, pray that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, Father, we are thankful for your word and uh, the reminder this morning to keep you first. As Jesus rephrased it, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind, and our strength. 
We pray that we would keep you first in, in our worship and worship you alone and, and not try to redefine you or make you something that you aren't. That we'd keep you first by reverencing your name, by not using it lightly, by not throwing it around carelessly, but reverencing and honoring that name. And that we would keep you first by taking and using the rest that you've given to to hollow it, to think upon your things, and to honor you in a way that you have, have told us to. And Father, we pray that we would keep you first this week, that we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.